Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Beating Ransomware with Tools, Experience, and Recovery. This special webinar event is brought to you in partnership with Veeam, and we have a special guest who we'll introduce from BrainLink. This event is brought to you by, or produced by, Actual Tech Media. Before we jump into today's topic, just a little bit of information that you need to know about the event. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll serve as the moderator on this webinar. We are excited to have you on the event today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us. I know it's a crazy time in the world of technology and in the world in general a little bit, but uh, hopefully that you uh, hopefully you will learn a lot on today's event and get all your questions answered uh, when it comes to ransomware, data protection, and disaster recovery. Um, we want this to be educational, so speaking of questions, we encourage you to use the questions box. It's there on the left-hand side of your audience console. I can call your attention to it that way. And um, we'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of today's presentation, so get your questions in early, and uh, we'll be looking for some you know, tough challenges to, to hand off to our expert presenters to see what we can do to help. Uh, we also have a couple of handout links there in the handouts tab, one to uh, Veeam and one to BrainLink if you'd like more information uh, at the respective websites. And if you're watching this live, we will be announcing the winner of the Amazon $300 gift card at the end of the presentation. The prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenters. You'll hear from Mr. Rick Vanover, Director of Technical Product Marketing at Veeam, and Mr. Raj Goel, owner of BrainLink. Rick and Raj, it's great to have you on the event. Rick, I'll hand it first off to you. Take it away. Well, thank you, David, and a big warm welcome to everyone who's attended today. And I just really want to know if I can win that $300 Amazon gift card, but I'm going to take it that the answer is no. And our topic today is beating ransomware with tools, experience, and recovery. And our, our main objective today is to give you some information, some experience to help you do that. And I've got Raj on with me. Uh, Raj, uh, you know, thank you so much for, for joining us. And, um, you know, this is a topic that's actually rather serious. It is serious, and it's a very near dear to my heart, and I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So you can follow Raj uh, at Raj Goel underscore NY, and he's definitely from New York, make no mistake. And uh, I'm Rick Vanover on Twitter, and we've got a lot to cover, so let's uh, just jump into it. And I've broke it into kind of some practical segments here. So what I've done with the ransomware story at Veeam, and I know that uh, uh, David was telling me there's a great crowd on here today. That's that's outstanding, and thank you again. I'm changing the story a little bit. Now, this is not necessarily uh, at face value what you think. I'm actually pivoting a little bit more to put some practical information that you may or may not know kind of forward so that you can go and be more prepared for ransomware and then also know a lot more about the behaviors of the different threats that are out there. The good news is there's plenty of Veeam resources out there. We're going to talk about that at the end, but in the middle, Raj is going to share his practicing IT expertise. And trust me, no detail gets away from Raj. Uh, to your point, Mary, Raj is indeed a fun person. So let's uh, jump into it. So the first thing I want to jump into are some behaviors and tools. Now, this is actually kind of a new segment that I've done in my ransomware series, and I found this very specifically needed to really highlight what we are dealing with from a behavioral standpoint in the Threatscape today, because ransomware isn't just what you think. And what I mean by that, it's not just encryption anymore. The threats are more targeted than ever and a variety of behaviors. I can give you nothing but evidence in the form of uh, stories, a lot of which, I'm, unfortunately, I can't share the details of. But I love going down to my tech support team or otherwise reaching out to them. We saw one, uh, it was about a year ago. This one was really interesting. It was a ransomware that actually made a call to SQL Server, for example, to encrypt the database with a native SQL key. And you were just buying a SQL key. That was the ransom. That is some really weird stuff, right? So just think of files deleted with a cryptic note. That's not the only behavior we're dealing with today. There are some other targeted examples. Deletion. There, there are some threat actors that like to go and 
slowly start deleting files and then more and then more, and the ransom will actually stop that behavior. So that's kind of an interesting behavior that we're seeing in, in the ransomware escape today. Another one is extortion. And what I mean by that is the ransom isn't just encrypting your files, but it will put them up on the internet or the dark web or other places for the highest bidder. And that's a different type of behavior. So this is one that I, sideways, when it comes to backup data, I really recommend you encrypt your backups at all steps of the way, even on-prem local disk, because if some of the threat actors are out there, they will know to just take your backup file, right? So have encryption every step of the way. And then there's this other phenomena that's going on today, and it's what I'm called calling dwell or dwelling, as well as awareness. So there's an interesting phenomena with some of the specific uh, ransomwares that are becoming more and more targeted. And there is one very large profile ransomware attack of a mapping service provider recently that was, I saw a review of how that worked. Very, very specific, not messing around. It knew exactly what it was going for. Likewise, when it comes to the way out of ransomware, your backup data or your recovery plan or the different parts of your infrastructure, these ransomware threats will have advanced mechanisms to know what to look for and be aware. The other phenomena dwell consequentially will make it aware of the different aspects of your environment. But the real concern here is that it will know where your backups are. It will know other things like that. I spoke to one user recently that we showcased at Veeam on. It was sending the ransom note to the printers to spook out the users. This is some of the threats we're dealing with today. Now, how do ransomware threats operate? I took this from the end of last year. Coveware, if you're not familiar with Coveware, they do a lot of good analyses on where the threats come from. I found it very surprising that at the end of last year, 58% of threats came in through RDP or otherwise remote access compromising. That actually, that number's actually gone up from the end of last year to the end of Q2 of this year. Email phishing has gone up and software vulnerabilities have gone down. So that 58 has gone up, the 26 has gone up, and the 13 has gone slightly down. But my real important piece of information here is that if you take remote access seriously, and Raj has got his number one tip hits on that very specifically, uh, if you have training around email phishing and awareness, if you have processes around vulnerability tracking and updates, et cetera, you can knock out approximately 97% of the common attack vector of ransomware. And I'm going to come back to this here in a second. But Coveware is a really good set of resources that you can have to be aware of how the threats operate. Now, I also want to highlight some tools. And I actually was only really aware of one of these before I, uh, before I started getting serious with ransomware. I was familiar with ESET. But the MSOF Emergency Kit is a really nice way to do like, you know, on-demand scan if you think you've got an issue, especially, you know, move it in from a USB and go offline. Same thing with Hitman Pro. You can do some advanced scanning. And the ESET scanner as well. I like the online scanner for ESET because it will pull the latest definitions, and if you want to scan a system for possible threat activity, you can see what's going on. Now, all of the antivirus tools, all of them, they really work on a premise of being able to detect the file signatures of ransomware threats. Now, this is a moving target, so the latest definitions are always going to be um, a really good idea. And that's why I like some of these kind of ad hoc tools because they will pull the latest definitions from the internet. There's no guarantee that Windows Defender in your environment, your data center, your endpoints, or whatever product you're using can automatically do the dynamic updates, much less do they handle them the same way. And I have some information on that here in a second. But if you have a situation where a device may or may not be compromised and you want to check, this is a really good set of a top three, lack of a better word. And then if you get into a problem, you've got ransomware in your environment, you have some data encrypted. Now, the good news is, is if you have some of the older ransomware threats that are out there, they have actually been 
quote unquote um, profiled, lack of a better word, where some of the law enforcement teams, organizations who have paid the ransom, they're collaboratively working together at the ID ransomware site to share common decryption tools. So let's take CryptoLocker. I don't know if that one's in there for sure specifically, but I know it's an older one. If that comes back up, you could probably, or some other older ones, you can get a free decryption up there. Now, if you get a very new, very targeted one, that's probably not going to be in there, but it's definitely worth a shot. Uh, idransomware.malwarehunterteam.com. And then a different one is the no more ransom.org site. You know, similar thing again, uh, from some of the older strains, many languages, they have a similar type of angle where you put up the encryption file or the hash, and it potentially could give you a key that may work. Caution here. If you start giving bad keys that can make the ransomware behavior differently. So, um, keep that in mind, but something to think of, but these are very good resources. I think education around the threats, how they behave, the tools you have, very important. And this is probably the best one. The PC Security Channel, Leo. I, I love this content. I, I This is the only YouTube uh, channel I subscribe to, just to give you perspective. This channel, Leo does basically does product reviews of the ransomware uh, strains themselves. He goes through a very... Um, a very thorough process where he'll show you how they behave. He, I don't know where he gets them, but I'm jealous. But anyways, he, he'll launch these ransomwares, he'll encrypt systems. But the other thing he will do is show how the different antivirus products can respond to the different behaviors of these ransomwares. So very important to keep that in mind that, you know, being familiar with their behaviors will train you to not have to fumble through what's going on. And that's important because if ransomware gets in your environment, time is absolutely of the essence. So I think that uh, a lot of organizations agree that if you have ransomware, start disconnecting networks, shutting things down, etc. If you spend time trying to say, well, what does this mean? Or if you have a user that says, hey, I have a very cryptic message on my desktop, text it to me, read it to me, that's time. You're losing time. Anyways, the PC security channel and the founder, Leo, outstanding behavior. I've, I'll admit I get a lot of my education from Leo. This guy, good stuff. So that being said, that's some of the educational aspects. And then I'd like to turn it over to Raj. To Well, Raj, first of all, introduce yourself, and then we'll get into some of your ransomware tips. Hey, folks. So I'm Raj Goel from BrainLink International in New York City. Uh, I run a managed services provider, or as it calls it, a magnificent, magnificent service provider. We work both with our clients who are businesses in New York and with other IT organizations where they have announced IT and they are either they want to get ahead of ransomware and security threats and actually have a really robust disaster recovery and business continuity program, or they've had incidents and now uh, they want to put up better defenses and lock the uh, and lock the environment down from the attackers. So you can call us before you have a problem or after we work with in both scenarios. And if somebody and yeah. So here are my uh, these are the top seven tips we use in our business and we recommend to our clients. Uh, and I'm happy that if you take and apply any of them, applying all seven is great. If you apply even two out of seven, you're further ahead than most. First and foremost is use two-factor authentication. I am surprised in 2020 how many organizations and how many smart organizations still do not use two-factor. There is no perfect two-factor. Any two-factor is better than nothing. And if you're in a firm with no IT budgets and you know you can't get a budget from management, still two-factor your, admi your administrative accounts. You know, uh, for Windows environments, I like Duo a lot. Um, Windows Hello um, login in Windows 10 is really good. Depending on your environment, there's multi-factor for Linux, multi-factor for Mac. At minimum, multi-factor your administrative accounts. And secondly, where possible, reduce your user's privileges. Your user should not be able to install software 
especially ones that require administrative credentials without using a separate administrative account. And if we can train really, really cranky, very, very busy, very rich professionals in doing this in New York, you can do it in your organization. Second is use a password manager, especially for the IT administrators and IT admins, but then throughout your organization, it does no good to have great security, great backups and everything else if you've got password.xls, password.doc, and secret.xls running rampant on your network. As a security assessor, I've been called in by organizations to look at their security, and all I ask is three things. Sign my contract, give me a comfortable chair, a network jack, and tell me where the coffee machine is. And if I can't find actionable items within two days, don't pay me. And I have found passwords, I have found photos, I have found campaign donations sitting out there on network shares because people still think Excel files are secure and even the built-in password security in, Wind, uh, in Office is secure. It's not. So get, your, get yourself and your users to keep, keep their passwords in a password manager, out of the browser, out of Word, out of Excel, out of Outlook. Third, have really, really good, reliable, human verified backups. Yes, I'm in, a vendor, uh, I'm in the session with Veeam and they're a backup vendor, but whatever product you use, make sure you have backups. Remember, everybody backs up, very few recover. If you haven't tested your backups, you don't know if you actually have recoverable data. Test, test frequently, test often, automate as much as you can but also have a human being verify that backups are actually there and real, it does you no good if your software says, hey, I got a screenshot, I can boot up to Windows, and when you do an actual restore, none of your MMCs work. I've lived through that experience. I've lived through that litigation. It's not a happy place to be. So spend the extra 15, 20 half minutes, half hour in your DR test, verify you can log into Windows, you can launch your applications, you have complete application testing whether it's QuickBooks, whether it's ERP, whether it's CRM, the applications must work. Otherwise, the backups are meaningless. If you can, and you're in a Windows environment, don't domain join your backup servers to the domain. I know it's easy to do, and you can just add a server in, and it's on your domain and your credentials work. But that also means if you can log in easily to your backup server, so can the bad guys. And it doesn't matter if you, the threat actor is ransomware, malware, deleteware, or spyware. Muggers, pickpockets, carjackers, kidnappers, it doesn't matter what their motivation is. Keep away from them, avoid them where you can, lower your, uh, your risk uh, threshold. And one of the easiest way to do that is not to leave your crown jewels sitting on a domain and your backup server is, is your crown jewels. If you're backing it up, that's where all the goodies are. Uh, if you're storing uh, your data in the cloud, you know whether it's Amazon, uh, Azure, Google, whoever, they all have some amazing technologies that you can implement, which are difficult to do on-prem, but easy to do in the cloud. So at BrainLink, uh, we use both Azure and AWS for our clients. And one of the best practices we have ahead upon is yes, there's an account for doing recon and backing up the assets, whether they're born in the cloud or born on prem and being back up to the cloud. And then we have a separate isolated account, completely different username, completely different credentials, setting in a different availability or recovery zone that has read only access to our production backup environment. This account can't delete, this account can't modify, this account can't do anything except to take read-only data from our backup environment. So if you happen to get the domain admins, uh, domain credentials on our client networks or our networks, and you somehow get the cloud credentials and you delete the backups on-prem and the cloud, or you corrupt them, unless you have some way of discovering this break in glass account, you know, break glass in emergency, otherwise no one knows this account exists you are not going to delete or destroy all of our backups. Yes, it costs money. Yes, it requires some learning how to use the cloud effectively. There are plenty of ways to do it wrong. That's why it's number six on my seven. It is a bit complicated. Or number five on my seven. It's a bit complicated to do. But if you've got a lot of assets in the cloud, this is a great capability you have in the cloud that you just cannot do on-prem. You can hide stuff away. You can snapshot stuff. 
and no one's ever going to find it. So make sure you document where it is and you do not document it in the same place you document everything else. Uh, in our case, for some of our clients, we actually have that data, those credentials stored uh, on hard copy in the lawyer's office, in the offsite external legal counsel. We're only going to use that account if everything else is burned down. And in that case, that's the envelope I'm breaking open to get those credentials. Number six, perform disaster recovery tests like clockwork. Don't delay them. Don't put them off. Don't go, you know what? I've got to deal with Outlook. I've got to deal with network slowness. If you don't take your disaster recovery test seriously, you do not know what your exposures are. And in our firm, we do our DR test twice a year for every one of our clients, and we expect the DR test to fail. If a DR test goes too smoothly, I get worried because it's not uncommon for clients on us to add new servers, uh, retire old servers, upgrade applications, and sometimes your, your DR documentation is out of date. You know, did you take the new um, application server into account? Is the old one that was retired three months ago off of your backup cycle? So a good DR test not only proves you have the data, but also proves you have the proper documentation and the processes and the communication flow with your team to bring the company or the organization back in the event of a fire, a flood, a Sandy. DR tests are religion. Take them seriously. And this tip I put at the end because this does require a bit of organizational maturity and executive buy-in. If you're a one-person shop, uh, this is not very helpful. If you're a mid-sized firm with real revenues or a larger firm, if you're in IT, speak to your CFO, your CTO, whoever deals with your uh, insurance agent, your business insurance agent, and somebody in your firm, somebody not in IT, somebody in compliance, somebody in legal, somebody in finance, somebody in the CEO's um, office, needs to know what your insurance policy covers, needs to know what your ca a carrier provides for. If there's ransomware at, at, in our environment, if we discover it's ransomware, yes, we're going to pull the plug. We are not going to go in and try and fix it. We're not going to run any decryptors against it. We're going to call our carrier, call our insurance agent, initiate the claim coverage, and let their experts come in, identify the ransomware, do the recovery, or pay the ransom. Uh, treat ransomware like a murder scene. You know, if you're not a forensics examiner, if you're not law enforcement who's authorized to be there, don't trample over the, uh, the crime scene with your size 11 shoes and track blood everywhere and leave your DNA in place. Ransomware is a legal problem and a business problem that happens to look like a technical problem. Know what your coverage uh, allows you to do, know what your coverage prevents you from doing, and know what resources your carrier brings to the table. This is not 2010 when insurance ca carriers didn't know ransomware and IT. Today, every carrier that provides cyber insurance has a cyber response team full of lawyers, technicians, uh, PR folks, experts whose job is to help your business get up and running and minimize the expenses and the downtime and sometimes relying, actually in most cases, relying on the professionals will lower your cost and lower your blood pressure. Trying to fix the problem yourself, you'll make it worse. Raj, that is outstanding. And, you know, for the listeners here, I can't emphasize how deep and accurate all of Raj's advice is. In fact, I don't know if everyone saw last week, there was in Europe, a German hospital had a ransomware situation and someone died, and so now there's homicide charges filed. Okay, th that's how serious uh, Raj's comments can be interpreted here. And if you look backwards through these, this is very, very true. You know, test DR as if you're going to use it. I love that, right? And then if you think about the isolated storage break glass account, I like that term, break glass, because I was actually, I wasn't quite sure how you're going to explain that, but uh, it made sense to me. But that's actually very fundamental. At Veeam, we think the same way, especially with our uh, backup accounts, whether they're on-prem backups or in the cloud backups, you can use different credentials. This don't domain join. This is a really big deal. I spoke to a lot of organizations who have been through ransomware, and some of the changes they make afterwards are right here. Don't have domain administrator in use for everything. 
copy that with, uh, you know, think about Linux, right? A lot of times in Linux environments, people don't domain join or they have independent islands of credentials. Management domains, isolated fabrics, those are the types of things you want for your backup server. And over here, 2FA, if you remember anything from this webinar, two-factor authentication, especially for your backup resources, password manager, and knowing that you can recover. Hey, Raj, thank you so much. That was outstanding information. And thank you, Chris and others for this, uh, the, the great feedback. Rick, I'll just put in one correction, and it's not just 2FA for your backup resources, it's 2FA for every administrative account and privileges, because if you're not 2FAing all your domain creds, if you're the IT person or the IT manager, uh, yeah. 2FAing only just your backup server isn't going to help you any if I can overwrite your creds as domain admin. Or turn off 2FA, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, good point. 2FA all the way, how about that? Yeah, let's uh, wise words. Thank you so much, Raj. I and want again, that on a T-shirt. Okay, <laughs> you would a lot. You should have heard what we was asking for before the call. So uh, great information, Raj. So how can we kind of package this up on the Veeam side? And I, I've, every single, every single one of Raj's tips, I agree hundred percent. And I look at Veeam in the market here. I have a mission to educate the market on how to beat ransomware. And a lot of times when I introduce Veeam to people, these are what these are the three things I tell people that Veeam does in the market. These are the problems that we solve. One, Veeam provides resiliency against ransomware threats. I'm, I'm putting that first on the list. Yes, absolutely. I can defend it too. And then that is a gateway to so many other ways you can get out of that phenomena. So getting out of ransomware, um, you know, Raj, I'll put you on the spot. You've probably had a number of situations with some of your clients. True or false? No two ransomware threats behave the same. I would say false. Uh, and mostly because I don't get involved in the nitty gritty of what the ransomware is. I look at ransomware like disease, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, whether it's cancer or heart disease or something like that. You know, I don't care what type of cancer I've got. If I've got cancer, I want the right cancer specialist. If I've got heart disease, let the doctors worry about what strain it is and what part of my heart it's met, it's dealing with. Mm -hmm. I just want them to make the pain go away and make me feel better. And so for us, ransomware falls under our super category of uh, business impacting or business ending threats. You know, is it a street mugging? Is it a pickpocket? You know, if you pick my pocket and you grab my, grab my wallet, that's a minor inconvenience. If you yeah. uh, jack me at the ATM and you take cash out of my account, that's a minor inconvenience. If you carjack me uh, or you kidnap, that's a much bigger problem. And if you've got, you know, either ransomware outbreaks or even things like, as we had Hurricane Sandy in New York in 2012, you know, parts of New York lost power for weeks or months. Right. If you've lost power or you've got hurricanes or tornadoes. So to me, ransomware falls in a disaster category, environmental, digital, it doesn't matter. If you're in a covered business like healthcare or finance, you got to keep your business running and keep the data flowing. The law doesn't care what the threat was or what the disaster was. You've got to make your customers good and whole. So for us, ransomware co comes into that category. I don't care if it's ransomware or mm -hmm. Con Ed blowing a steam pipe or Verizon mm -hmm. cutting a fiber or Sandy taking out electricity in lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I've got to keep my clients' data flowing, keep them, keep their payroll flowing. Uh, keep their vendors paid and keep their customers uh, functional. So to me, this is a ransomware is a small item in my long list of threats I have to defend against. That's just part of living in the modern world. You know, you're right. Yep. You got wildfires in California. Indeed. That was not on my threat radar 20 years ago. Uh, earthquakes in New York were not on my radar. Well, in the last 10 years, we've had a tornado, we've had an earthquake, we've had Sandy. Uh, and then, you know, and we had 9-11, so all of a sudden, my environmental threat matrix grew five-fold in the last 10 years. Yeah, and you could, you, you basically also should throw into the mix here things like accidental deletion internally or malicious administrators, right? Those are threats as well, and you almost have to equate ransomware to this long list of plenty of things that can go wrong, and... Uh, the way I look at it at Veeam is I have kind of conflated them to this kind of threat plane, 
Threatscape. And I think two other things that come with Veeam make it very compelling for organizations today. One is a portable data, data format. And that at face value may not seem very interesting, but the reality is we can take backup data and restore it elsewhere. We can restore it to Azure. In fact, uh, that's something that Raj is very good at. We can restore it to a service provider. We can restore it to your DR site. We can take physical servers or even endpoints that have been compromised with ransomware and restore them as virtual machines. You name it, the portability is there. And when it comes to Veeam products, we focus in very specifically of, from a product strategy standpoint of being software defined, hardware agnostic and cloud ready. This will be a very important thing when you think about how do I need to restore this data? Maybe I don't trust where it came from, or maybe it's underwater, or maybe it's otherwise compromised. That's kind of the mindset. When it comes to ransomware, one other thing I'll highlight that Veeam has as a capability, and this is available for free, by the way. So if you have a VMware or a Hyper-V environment, I really encourage everyone on the webinar here to go to veeam.com and download Veeam 1. Veeam 1 is a, a learning management monitoring reporting type of tool. And in there, there is an alarm called the possible ransomware activity alarm, which is what I have selected here. What this will do on VMware and Hyper-V environments is look for sustained high CPU with sustained write I.O which could be, it's not the only behavior, but it could be a behavior associated with ransomware. So if I get this type of alarm, this would be a technique that I could reduce the time between when a ransomware is introduced and when it starts to make its behavior known. So this is an example of something. I encourage you to check this out. And then we also have uh, that alarm. You can could, you could configure it, you know, a little bit more conservative, a little bit more aggressive. I saw one individual take this alarm very seriously. Now, this is not available in the free edition, but what they did was they made this alarm automatically shut down the virtual machine. That's pretty aggressive. You know, sure, email me, text me, or something like that, but uh, automatically shut it down. That's interesting. That's pretty aggressive, but that's, you know, the art of the possible with some of the handling here. And then we have another uh, new thing where, from a backup perspective, we're doing some analyses on workloads that we're, that Veeam is backing up. And if we see a very significant amount of change rate, that being not normal, we'll flag an alarm. We call it suspicious increment, right? Why did you have 100% change rate? It could have been ransomware. Anything we can do to raise that visibility. I mentioned earlier, I talked a lot to our support team and I, you know, I love hearing the stories about, yeah, we beat it, we won, we got the customer recovered, great. But most of the times, to Raj's point, the customers deal with ransomware when they're not prepared for it. So you'll find themselves, oh, thank goodness I had a DR from last week, or I had a backup in Azure, or I had whatever. But if we take some of these preparation points very seriously, we, we will not get into the bit of a kind of a low... Uh, quality experience on a recovery. You want a really good RPO if you have to restore or fail over or whatever else. But when I talk to the support team, I also focus a lot on when things don't go as expected. So the number one thing when I talk to my support team about if ransomware is in the mix and what's given the customers problems, it's not having an ultra resilient copy or multiple copies of backup data. Uh, I live in a world where I want a belt, suspenders, and maybe I'm going to have a string in my pocket holding everything together. Three copies or more, uh, and I got more on that here in a second. Another piece of advice that our support team, which aligns consistently to Raj's advice, is permissions and harden hardening as well as separation. These two start to blur a little bit. And what I mean by that is permissions can be very broad, two-factor authentication across the board. Definitely think about that for your backup infrastructure. Hardening, meaning if you think about any backup infrastructure, because that's really one of your only ways out or your DR plan. Think about having explicit minimal required permissions with 2FA, with 
being on a different administrative realm, so not on the domain, or maybe a separate domain uh, just for your backup infrastructure or something like that that's not trusted to everything else. Separation, separation, separation. I can't emphasize these enough. But the thought is these almost become a mathematical equation of your risk uh, around how much of this you embrace. Now, when when I started, I kind of had this split from Coveware. You might remember when I talked about the RDP, email phishing, software vulnerabilities. If I were to pivot that to practical advice in Veeam implementations, two-factor authentication for your backup, as well as everything that's administratively sensitive, explicit minimal permissions, and then no internet access. That's kind of an important one because if you think about some of the dwell behaviors, there may be report back to the threat actors of what's going on. If you are sending backups to Azure, I recommend shaping that traffic explicitly from the data source to Azure or AWS. And then on the reverse, network rules that only allow that inbound right from there, just like you would if it was site-to-site -site internet, that type of thing. Um, email phishing, I recommend training like GoFish and um, you know a number of different tools around, or know before, sorry, know before is the other one, training your users around how they can be assessed for their fish risk. And this is a beautiful thing. It simulates fish email, right? So you'll actually get a list of who opened that fish email. And then you know to go give them training on ransomware and those types of things. Couple that with endpoint protection, back up the laptops. Why? Ransomware happens there too. There probably is data capture there too. And then also from a vulnerability perspective, I kind of spin this one a little bit and the data labs can help you out. A lot of times I talk to organizations in the data center who never get around to doing Windows updates because they can't test it. Well, spend two hours learning about the data lab and I guarantee you, you'll be able to test it. So I did mention earlier that the number one piece of advice from my Beam support team was around having an ultra resilient copy of a backup. So I'll admit, now Raj, I made up a word, ultra resilient backup. So it would be one of the four that are the lighter green, tape, immutable backups in the cloud, offline media, insider protection with our Cloud Connect technology. You, nothing gets by Raj. Raj, what do you think of my word, ultra resilient? Engineered correctly, yes. And I think one of the things you missed, uh, Rick, uh, or one of the points you missed, and I don't think Beam stresses enough, is unlike some of the other products we used to use that li limited us to only re uh, restore, uh, backing up to their cloud or a data center or something else, with Veeam, you can actually have your backups simultaneously replicate uh, to multiple environments so you can have your data in AWS, in Azure, in a data center, and in a test lab, as long as your bandwidth allows it. And that is a capability of Veeam that lets us have ultra resilient, resilient backups because now you have to take down not just one environment, my on-prem, or two, my on-prem and my cloud, but you have to know and find and break my four or five or six environments I'm backing up your data to. And for some clients, we're doing that. And we don't publicize where we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, it is something the senior management knows as part of our documentation to the client. And yes, if you want ultra resilient backups, I think the 3-2-1 rule is outdated. It should be 654321 because with the cloud vendors and with the Veeam's ability to replicate to multiple environments, local, local isolated, yeah. offsite one, offsite two, cloud one, cloud two, cloud three, objects on the cloud, it makes no sense anymore to build your backup solution the way we did it five or 10 years ago, where you go from point A to point B or from point A to tape or, or disk or send, you can now do four or five, six way matrices and Veeam and some of the other good products make that easy and manageable and reportable. And that's one of the things I love about Veeam. I'm not tied to one vendor or one environment. All right. You're right about the three, two, one rule not being enough. I'm actually trying to jockey to make it a phone number, area code CDP, 
seven six five four three two one is I don't know. I gotta work on that. But we'll just go with three four I don't know, three two one zero zero. Don't you right? mean A six three five seven oh nine? Something like that. But if you need a practical place to start, I would recommend at least one ultra resilient copy tape. Think about worm media or something completely removed from the library. Think about on the bottom immutable backups in the cloud. This is a really powerful capability uh, going into S3 or S3 compatible systems with the object lock capability. Rotating hard drives offline, you know, disconnected media, that's a good one. Service providers who offer Veeam Cloud Connect with insider protection, that's an out of band copy of the media. And then you can also get into some replication technologies, the, the backup copy job to other sites with completely different authentication mechanisms. Primary storage snapshots are a great way as well. Keep in mind things like NetApp Snap Lock, Pure Storage Safe Mode Snapshots, some, the Exagrid Retention Lock Zone. You, know, you get some of these other uh, storage systems to help you out, right? You can get into some really effective techniques. Now, we have a whole bunch more about this at Veeam.com, but I want to get people thinking about one or more copies of ultra resilient backups. And then I mentioned that the immutable backups on the bottom in the public cloud. I kind of have to explain how that works. Now, the immutable backups with Veeam are done with a technology called the scale out backup repository. Now, the scale out backup repository is a software defined, help me out, hardware agnostic and cloud ready secondary storage device. So what this means is this, if you have on-premises storage resources that are direct attached storage, network attached storage or DDoP appliances, you can have all three, you can have just one of them, you can have 33, very mix and match. That logically is connected is what I wanna call the performance tier. This is a logical target for backup jobs. Now the beauty, the, this was actually created as if you had like a, infrastructure component and something was offline and that all your backups wouldn't fail. Example, the DDoP appliance is offline. It's backup time. I'll just put the backups on the other two storages and then tomorrow the DDoP comes back. Great, we'll carry on. That's the logic. We've enhanced that over the years to extend it to the cloud. We call it the capacity tier. Now, where it gets really interesting recently, which is now in our latest version, is this notion of a copy mode and some immutability. So when we initially added the cloud tier or the capacity tier, it was meant to give a longer term storage. So the thought is maybe on premises, I only wanted a week of backups, but I need to keep seven years. So I'll keep a week on prem and I'll keep uh, seven years in the cloud, but it, with the move mode, it was only, let's see, six years and 51 weeks. Well, now I can do this copy mode that'll keep all seven years in the cloud. And if I couple that with the immutability that comes with S3 and S3 compatible storages, that is actually a really resilient technique against ransomware. So we got a lot more about that technology at veeam.com, but it's actually very compelling, very advanced, very easy to use. Now, we have a lot of information at veeam.com. I made this recommendation a couple of different times. So if you're a technical person, I recommend the bit at the bottom. And I just wrote a paper about some specific configuration with Veeam. I hit almost every single one of these topics we went over, but I've got screenshots and links to documentation, etc. So go to the vwe.am forward slash ransomware series papers to get that. And then... On the education site, we have a couple of uh, different statistics and overviews of some of the ransomware behaviors. And then on the top is the assessment kit, right? You know, how many copies of backups do you have? You know, how are you configured in this regard? Blah, blah, blah. You can get a, a assessment for your, your risk level of the ransomware threatscape. So with that, I kind of want to wrap up with my, my overall mindset. I think ransomware resiliency breaks down into three things. One, education. And it's not just the IT pro. I think end users, administrators, everyone needs education. Just by you being here on this webinar, you're making a great first step. Really recommend checking out Leo at the PC uh, security channel and some other 
uh, resources as well. Raj's tips, practitioner, great, great advice. But I think also your backup and recovery implementation, everything from DR, failing over to new places, storing backups in something ultra resilient, having that separation, two-factor authentication for your backup infrastructure and more are all great. And if you do those two well, you're going to go into having an effective remediation plan. How do I get out of this problem? And once you do that, and if you encapsulate everything we're doing at Veeam, there's actually quite a few capabilities. And over on the right, I've kind of introduced them in different levels. And, you know, I wanted to make this a little bit more informative. And thank you, Alan, for the comment. But the thought here is Veeam can work you from the start of detection all the way down to confident restores. So our thought here is having detection capabilities, which we spoke about briefly, one of those free with Veeam, Veeam 1. The 3 to one rule, which we can upgrade a little bit, like how many copies you're storing, having something in an immutable backup. The data integration API, if you want to have some real fun, this is interesting. This is a great way to crack into the backups and like do advanced scanning and looking for encrypted files, right? That's covered in my paper. I like to say this is the art of the possible. You can do some really amazing stuff with that. And then once you get into actually restore scenarios, you know, maybe sure backup is going to catch the uh, this ransomware behavior before it's due, right? Because sure backup will boot the VM up and ensure that it's recoverable. Well, maybe some ransomware kicks off on a boot. Um, you also could use the sure backup engine to see if the ransomware behavior exists for an associated restore point. You can do storage integration recoveries. You can have copies on ultra resilient media. The secure restore can look to ensure that there's no threats on the latest definitions and more. There's so much to it. And you can get all of that over at the, the again, the bottom link is probably the most uh, effective one there. So now might be a good time to screenshot that. And whoo, David, we went through a lot of content. And so uh, we do have some questions and I'll turn it over to David to administer the Q&A. Absolutely. Yeah. Great presentation. Great uh, questions. I don't think I've seen more uh, valuable, actionable, you know, ransomware, ransomware prevention uh, tips in a single place. So this has been really cool. Um, if you have a question for Rick or Raj, now's the time to get it in because we're kicking off some Q&A. So uh, Rick, I know there's a number of questions there in the queue. If you see any that catch your eye, feel free to point them out. Um, I'll just start with a, a question for, for Raj first. And that is, Raj, if you had to pick one or two superpowers of Veeam, what would they be? So first is the ability to back up our data into multiple locations and environments simultaneously. That was something we'd struggled with for about 15 years with other products and with Veeam, it was just built into the box. And second is the automation capabilities that PowerShell and Veeam bring to the table. They have completely rewritten our rule book on how we do disaster recovery and backups testing. Better work, less labor, lower cost. Awesome. I like that. Better work, less labor, lower cost. And, and automation it sounds like the key there, really. Uh, a big it key. Is. So a next question, this one I'll just throw out to either one of you. Uh, do you have any recommendations for restoring domain controllers with DNS? Ooh. So uh, my recommendation on domain controller restores is I love living in a world of, you know, you don't just want to do an image-based backup of a domain controller unless it's an end of days type of situation. I'm much more uh, a fan of role seizure uh, and, and fixing that across domain controllers. First of all, you should not have just one. Uh, and the second thing is for DNS, which most of them do have, I recommend a lot of application item recovery. So example, if DNS is a problem, like somebody deleted some entries, just restore that. And actually Veeam Explorer for Active Directory can help you with that, as well as restoring group policy objects, user accounts, et cetera. Um, I'll, I'd recommend people go over to veeam.com for some information around uh, restoring domain controllers and such. And if, in putting that in a ransomware context, you know, I always recommend calling support, whether it be, you know, Raj mentioned some of your cybersecurity experts that may be part of the insurance options. Think about your backup vendors, your platform vendors. Always, always get the help you need. Great advice. 
Thank you. Uh, good answer too, as well. So another question here, this one comes from Paul. Uh, let's see, he said, there's a story that a security services firm got hit by a ransomware attack this week. Without knowing the details, does the vulnerability lie more with human error or are the mitigating tools, skills challenged to keep pace with the skills and tools of the attacker? Uh, Rick and Raj, what's your take? Well, I'll, I, I'm actually curious to Raj's take on this as well. But um, So Raj, why don't you go first and then I'll uh, kind of come in with my uh, answer to sure. Paul's question. Uh, my take is it doesn't matter whether it was human error or technological failure or a gap in technology or a root cause in Windows or Cloudflare or DNS. It doesn't matter what the flaw was. Uh, you know, uh, once you have disease, heart disease, cancer, or whatever, uh, or the flu, it doesn't, you know, where you got it and when you got it is something for the medical examiners and forensics to deal with. The key thing is avoid it, avoid getting it when you can. And if you can't, then remediate it. So nobody is perfect. Everybody, everybody has similar risks. We all run on the same operating systems. Fundamentally, Windows is never going to be secure. SMTP was never meant to be secure. The internet was never meant to be secure. And as Dan Greer said on the internet, your nearest neighbor is a, is a local psychopath. You know, everybody is your neighbor on the internet. And I live in a big city. So, you know, your risks have to depend on where you are, what business you're in, and what makes sense for you. You know, I have friends in small towns. They never used to lock their front doors or leave their cars locked. In New York, uh, deadbolts, locks, and clubs for your car are mandatory. So... It doesn't matter where the threat came from or what the uh, the risk is there, and it what matters is what is it worth to your business to avoid it, to mitigate it, and how quickly can you recover from it? And it's not just software and data. You know, a big problem with a lot of disaster recovery plans is they assume people are going to be perfect. Well, if you look at uh, environmental disasters like Sandy, like fire, like flooding in Louisiana. How does your farm recover and stay in business if your key employees are unavailable? Or, you know, at 9-11, a couple of the funds that were in the towers, well, all their employees died. The rest of the firm that was the people who were not in the towers had to recover and run the business. You have to, your disaster recovery plan or your business continuity plan can't just be about data and bits and bytes. You have to look at your people. I can tell you, and I... In the event of a real disaster, my first priority are my wife, my kids, my parents. Everything else comes second. And people who have pets, for them, their kids and their pets, or pets and their kids might come first, then everything else, they're not going to worry about your disaster recovery plan. They're not going to worry about your backup technology. They're not going to worry about doing what's right for the business. And this is one of the things you have to game out. What do we do if half our workforce can't come in the office, or they're out sick, or they're dead? or they're un unreachable because their inner provider had a fire. You know, Raj, agree, uh, agree with this. You have to kind of put every scenario in the worst case. And, you know, to Paul's question, we do see increasing sophistication uh, of threats. In fact, they're starting to show up on phones. You know, I saw a, a smart TV get hit by ransomware. Um, you know, so just think about it that way. Any device, it's not just, you know, PCs, servers, laptops, tablets, it's just going down the chain. And I think that there, you, you know, to Paul's question, does the vulnerability lie more with human error? I actually think there's an emerging situation of human intervention, disgruntled employee, you know, we all may have seen the news about a thwarted attack upon a large um, bat, um, electric car manufacturer, where there is a potential insider assist, right? So those phenomena are going in. Prepare for the worst. Trust nobody is my uh, my angle here. Really excellent advice. Uh, scary, you know, situation reminds me. There's a cartoon where it, it's a kind of a joke on IoT and ransomware. Uh, this guy's at in, in his like apartment, and every electronic device has been attacked by ransomware and you know the refrigerator is demanding money to open to get his food and the blender wants money and you know the coffee maker everything they're all held by ransom but um more and more that's kind of becoming reality uh, like you said uh, electronic cars everything like that 
Um, so scary times. Let's see. Next question I want to pose to you all are, um, Rick, when it comes to, you mentioned data labs. Can you kind of remind us what data labs is and, and how can this help us with, with ransomware? So the data lab is a Veeam technology in the user interface. We call it a virtual lab where we take the backups that we have taken or a replica or a storage snapshot. And that system is powered up in an isolated virtual lab, not connected to the network, but it has access to production compute, production memory. But from a storage perspective, it's read only from the storage snapshot backup or a replica. And it's a great way to do things like testing updates, testing changes, testing fixes to a problem. Uh, real short example, uh, you got a nasty script to go. Um, you don't know if it's going to work or not. Test it there. Don't test it on production. Uh, I've written some white papers on that as well, but it's a it's an incredible data reuse category or capability is the best way to put it. Okay. Okay. Great point. Um, and then when we talk about the three, two, one rule and getting data off site, uh, one of the most common questions I see here is like, what are my cloud options or what options does Veeam give me to get that data off site? Well, Veeam gives you a lot. Uh, that's a short answer. Uh, a lot of options and more options coming with Amazon, Azure, IBM Cloud, service providers, your own environment, public object storage, consumable, that's not those like Wasabi, so many options. Um, yeah, plenty. Of there's, there's probably any, nothing we can't do as a short answer. So, uh, you know, check out those white papers. And, um, you know, if you download a trial at Veeam, you'll, you'll kind of see what those capabilities are, but it's very easy to use. Yeah, and Excellent. jumping on top of what Rick said, uh, Veeam gives you lots of options, and the real challenge for you is looking at what are your firm's capabilities. And if you're primarily a Microsoft shop, Azure might be a better answer than trying to learn AWS and S3 out of, uh, from scratch. If you're a Google shop, maybe GCP is a better option. So it's not where can you uh, take your data from Veeam, it's what are you most comfortable running as an organization, and, that, and what's going to help you get it done faster and more reliably without three years of classes and getting it wrong. Yeah, great point. And that was one of your tips was to make sure you test disaster recovery, test, 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 and make sure you're comfortable with it. Because if you put all your data in AWS and then you need DR and you don't know how to spin that data up in AWS, then you're going to be in trouble. So Great points. All right. Well, it looks like we're running out of time here. Uh, tons of good questions coming in. Uh, lots of comments on how valuable this event was and, and how valuable Raj's tips were. So uh, thank you so much for those. Before we go, I do want to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card that's going out to uh, Vu Nguyen. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, but Vu Nguyen from Washington State. So congratulations. I'll reach out to you to deliver that gift card. Again, I want to remind everyone before you go, make sure that you check out these educational resources from Veeam, the Ransomware Assessment Kit, the Ransomware Educational Site, and the Executive and Technical Content Library uh, with uh, Rick's Ransomware Series papers over at as Rick said, vwe.am slash ransomware series papers. Just put that in your web browser. Raj, it's been really awesome having you on the event today with your practical seven tips. I really enjoyed those myself, and I know the audience did. Thank you for being on. It was my yeah. pleasure and my honor. And thank you to Rick as well. Always good to have you on, Rick. Uh, and thanks to Veeam for supporting today's, uh, today's event. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, David. Cheers. Cheers. And thank you to everyone out there in our audience for supporting the webinar today and attending. I hope that you learned a lot from the event. I know that I did. Uh, Raja's seven lucky tips are going to stick with me. I hope they stick with you as well. And you take those uh, and put those into practice. Everyone have a good weekend and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.